Welcome to the Spirited Conversation podcast, Straight Talk, Served Neat. Join us to hear from business leaders, entrepreneurs, and industry insiders as they discuss their stories and insights for success. Now, share a spirit and make a toast as you immerse yourself in the conversation. Here's your host and Chief Libation Officer, Tony DeBlau. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Spirited Conversation podcast. On today's show, I'm speaking with Emmy Award-winning digital media pioneers Paul Scanlon and Jeff Anison, founders of Legion M, the world's first equity crowdfunded entertainment company. I first met Paul and Jeff at Silicon Valley Comic Con, and I was blown away by their new venture. In only a few short months, Legion M has already climbed to over $500,000 in investment capital and is the first Title III offering in history to reach over 1,000 investors. We'll talk more about Legion M and their first company together, Moby TV, a company that revolutionized the way we get digital content to our mobile devices. These guys definitely know how to innovate and disrupt markets. So enjoy the conversation while we share a special spirit I've chosen for them and learn more about their journey to shake up Hollywood. Hello, everybody. My name is Tony DeBlau, and uh, we're here with another episode of Spirit of Conversation. And I'm very excited today because I'm joined by the dynamic duo behind <laughs> hey, I like that. Uh, yeah, Legion sure. M, uh, which You're is right. a incredible story, which we'll get to. Um, I'm with um, Paul Scanlon, who is the one of the co-founders of Legion M, and Jeff Anison, who Robin. is also... <laughs> I'm not Robin. Robin. I'm not right? Robin. He's well, Robin. I'm Batman. As, as we will come to we're find... We're both Batman. That's right. <laughs> we're dueling Batman. Well, as we come to find a lot of uh, parallels to a Wozniak Jobs oh, combination okay. with the uh, tech and the marketing and the sales. So very excited to uh, speak with you guys about your project and a little bit about your background and your journey to get to the Legion M project. But first, as we always do with Spirit Conversation is I've chosen a very special spirit for the two of you. And interestingly enough, as we'll talk about, Legion M is about disruption, right? It's about Mm -hmm. changing the very industry around entertainment and getting people closer to projects in a way that was never done before, a real fan-based, crowdsourced approach. Well, as you guys are on WeFunder, Mm -hmm. uh, I should also make a disclaimer up front. I am an investor in Legion M. Thank you for that. Uh, and Welcome. as part of that, I thought... One of our earliest investors, I think. Exactly. Yes. And we'll talk about that, too, in terms of how we met. But I thought, what wouldn't be the best choice but to have a also crowdfunded WeFunder Cleveland Whiskey Bourbon. Cleveland Whiskey. They're That's right. I've been dying to try this yes. stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. So they're, what's really, they're doing well, too, I think. So speaking of disruption... Uh, Tom Licks, who's the CEO of Cleveland Whiskey, said, I want to disrupt the bourbon market. Mm -hmm. And so he has a very interesting proprietary technology around accelerated aging of the bourbon with special wood finishes Mm -hmm. that give you that same nice, deep sense of a good tasting bourbon. So I've poured it for you. Let's give it a try. All right. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Cheers. Have you tried this before? I have not. This is inaugural for me oh, as well. Interesting. There we go. Cheers. Fellow Weed Funder. Not bad. Well, so I'm very curious to you as, yeah, as you're an the aficionado expert here. and yes. an expert. What do you think of this, both in principle, the idea of it, as well as now that you've tried it? Well, you know, the CEO, Tom Licks, you know, he said that there's been, of course, a lot of people who it's sacrilege. Right. You can't do it the same way. I thought... I've heard that story from somewhere <laughs> else before. You know, it can't be done. But I think that the taste comes back. It, it is a little bit on the hot side, yeah. which is typical when you're trying to do things a little bit faster under a lot of pressure. Okay. And you tend to bring that heat. There's a lot okay. of heat to yeah. this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of acetone. Yeah. But I think that generally it's, you know, this particular one is made with uh, the black cherry wood uh, wood you know, finish. And then he has different ways, maple, he has different, you know, kind of flavor signatures. Um, How long would an equivalent taste take? uh, I would say this, this, for me, this comes close to like a two, four year bourbon. So to be able to accelerate it that, that fast is, you know, it's pretty Pretty incredible. Right. Now, clearly it doesn't have the same flavor signature as a 20 year aged, you know, bourbon, but Disruptive technology, 
because we have a bourbon shortage. That's why you're seeing prices out through the roof, right? So to try to find a way to bring a quality bourbon to market faster and not lose all of that flavor is a pretty incredible feat. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, in the spirit of disruption and something new and new technologies, I thought that would be a good choice for you guys. I think it's absolutely a fantastic it's choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think one of the you know causes that we probably don't talk about enough that really needs more movement behind it is the bourbon <laughs> shortage. Yeah. It's true. What will happen? I know. In our you know what? <laughs> if we right. don't have enough bourbon, yeah, that's bourbon is American. Yeah. American. Yeah. 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 Right. How, what will we do? We'll have to start drinking tequila or something. I know. I know. We'll have to, we'll have to deviate. Right. So, uh, but again, you know, thanks again for taking the time to talk. I know there's a, there's a lot to talk about. As somebody who's been in tech my whole life, you know, I uh, really appreciate the story that's forming here. So I want to go back a little bit before we get into the Legion M. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that is the evolution of Moby TV. For, for people listening who don't know what it is, uh, back in the day when <laughs> mobile phones were very simple. The olden days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When uh, we had plenty of bourbon. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of bourbon. It was a simple time. You, know, you years. could get Happy Ben Winkle for $20. Uh, you know, we didn't, there, everything was in the world of analog. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about mobile phones and going from the brick to something that was in your pocket, nobody really thought about that evolution of, well, it's going to continue to kind of be a doorstop and actually you put something on it. So out of a great partnership between you and, of course, you have your one other yep. founding member, yeah, Philip. Philip. Yeah. Philip. Um, to Philip. To, to Philip. To <laughs> Philip. Cheers. Yes. And to the great concept that it is. Literally on a rainy, stormy, bolt of lightning night yep. uh, in the house, these sort of ideas started to form around, hey, we need to do something around content delivered to these mobile devices. So my question is, how did you start to think to get to that point of like, what are we going to do with this thing? You have these ideas, but at a time when the market didn't understand this, they, they thought that this idea might be crazy. How did you form well, into that? It's a, it's a good question. I think back then, one of our key insights that we were looking at, and we were looking several years ahead, and I think we're in a similar situation with Legion M that we'll get to, where we needed to predict what was going to happen with mobile phones. And Philip, who's not here with us, he had a real, he had had a strong background in display technology mm -hmm. and understood what was happening in the display field. And in the display field, if you looked at it closely, the manufacturing equipment overseas was starting to build really efficient, high resolution color screens in super high quality quantity. And it was, they were ramping up for what would ultimately become the screens on our phone. So remember, like this was back when we had green little digital screens on our phone. That was what we had. So they weren't even pixels. They were just yeah. digits. Little, little, yeah. little lines, you know. And so a lot of people, when you would talk to them at that time, and they had that phone in their hand, and you would say, we're going to put TV on their phone, they would say, they'd look at their phone and go, you're crazy. Like, I can't. But you had to be thinking about not the phone you have in your hand now, but the phone you're going to have three years from now. And we needed to be out in front and make that happen, be the, the market leader when those devices arrived. And, you know, and sure enough, we had sort of planned for it. And lo and behold, I mean, the numbers blew us away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it ended up becoming more screens faster in a tighter time frame than I think anyone would have predicted. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's interesting for me is you had to pitch an idea that was still in its infancy. I mean, people, I think kind of conceptually understood outside of the technology, the hardware limitations, right. But you had to go pitch people to get content yeah. to put it, oh, yeah. to, to create the technology around taking that and putting into that format how did that come about? We had to really invent the whole end-to-end -end system. You know, when we first 
started when we first kind of came up with the, with the idea and developed the technology, the early prototypes, our thoughts were, oh, well, let's go like sell this to a carrier. And this is great. You know, they're going to want to do it. And the carriers are like, well, we have no idea how to get like content. For this is like AT&T like and Verizon and T-Mobile. And yeah. so, you know, so we ended up literally having to build everything from we had to go out and sign deals with the channels to yeah. launch on Moby TV. And this was at content. a time yeah. you got to realize this was at a time. The only place those channels existed was in your living room. Right. Yeah. There was no Hulu. There was no watching TV on the internet. Like that's the only place was through a satellite or cable provider. And so mm-hmm. we go into these, these content providers and some of them would just laugh us out, yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of them didn't have the rights and it's not that they hadn't negotiated the rights. It's that those rights didn't exist. Nobody had contemplated who would have the rights, you know, for, yeah. they just for hadn't mobile. anticipated even right. when they were clearing rights with the actors and the directors and the people involved with the content, nobody had contemplated anything, but the current ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. And so carving out a whole new category, which was, these, you know, fast growing mobile devices was very foreign to the industry. And Mm -hmm. like Jeff said, I mean, a lot of people either A, didn't get it, B, just were intimidated by how complicated it would be. Oh, we don't have the rights. It'd be hard. But, you know, there were a few that did get it and saw it right away. Mm -hmm. And the ones, they still needed convincing. It wasn't (laughs) easy. And we were like a very small little outfit and you know, it was, we were a small company and we hadn't, you know, we had done some cool stuff in mobile, but, you know, we had a lot of convincing to do both on the, you know, it was a triangular sales process because we had to convince the carrier to do it. And we also had to convince the um, content providers. And then we had to build the product and get it out. Even selling the channels, right? Because we're doing something completely novel. Nobody had ever done it before. And so you go to like Discovery Channel and they're like, well, yeah, that's, it sounds really cool. You know, I don't know. I don't know if we want to be the first. And we're like, Mm. okay, what if we can get the History Channel? Would you be in? And they'd say, sure. So then we go to the History Channel and say, we got Discovery Channel in. Would you be interested? Well, you know, if you could get Discovery Channel and ESPN in, you know. And so it was literally, it was like this Plinko game. Contingencies. Where we had all these deals, they were all contingent on each other. And the very last piece came in, like literally midnight the night before we launched. Oh, it's a hilarious story. I mean, there were contingencies everywhere. I mean, starting with the carrier. We had to get a carrier to agree, but they wouldn't launch the product unless we had content. And they wouldn't sign a deal with us until we got content. So we finally convinced Sprint, sign the deal contingent on us getting content because we can't get content without a signed deal with you. So they signed that deal. Then we go out and as Jeff said, we were talking to everybody. The last minute we finally realized that they all were worried that they'd be the only channel. So we rewrote all the contracts that we had out with them, added these contingencies, put them out. We had everybody lined up. It's the night before launch. Everybody's anticipating tons of PR, all this stuff ramped up and ready to go. We've been working 24 seven without sleeping for like, you know, forever to get everything dialed in and get it organized. And the last linchpin was NBC. And they're on the East Coast in New York. And we're talking to our friend Salil is now a good friend of ours. And we're trying to get him to, he's like, I'm gonna get you the contract, it's gonna happen. You know, and we're waiting around. It's now like seven o'clock our time, 10 o'clock his time. And he's Mm. still working on getting us the contract. Finally, he calls us up. I got the contract. I'm sending you a fax right now. You guys are good to go. We're all celebrating in the office. We go into the the fax near the fax machine. This is when contracts were faxed. And we're waiting. And literally like seven blank pages come across the fax machine. We're like... What, the what, what happened? <laughs> oh my God. So we call up Salil. We're, Salil, what, what's going on? We got seven blank pages. He's like, oh, shoot. I put it in upside down. Oh, I'll, but God. I'm already in my car. I'll fix it in the morning. And we're like, no. no. <laughs> Stop. No, no, no. No. I'm sorry. I know it's 10 o'clock at night, but you need to go back to your office. Oh, God. All right, I'll go yeah. do it. And wow. he did. And then, you know, and we, we pulled it all together. But it was literally like a mirror. Right. In the meantime, so, I mean, obviously... You have staff. 
Oh yeah. You've got, you know, invest personal invested oh, into yeah, this yeah. So plus real invest plus yeah. you know other people backers. like it's it's a real oh. deal for you to be going oh, down this path to, to oh, yeah. understand like is this going to work or not well and that's and that's the thing like you know we you, you put it out there like when you launch a project or product there's this magical moment where the rubber meets the road right like you can guess you can talk you can market research you can whatever but you put it out there and you get your first sale yeah. And I remember distinctly with Moby TV, it was like that IBM commercial. It was that magical thing. You know, we get the first sale. Everybody's like, oh, my God. Once again, we had sale. a little tracker, and we're all standing around watching it. Yeah. So every time someone signed up, hmm. it would notch up, and it would just tick, 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 tick. We, had, we called it the ticker. Yeah. And it, we could all access it on any device. Any it was computer. a little HTML thing. Yeah. And, you know, had a password to it. And so, and it didn't say what it was for. It was just a number. And we all had access, and our parents had access, and our investors. Everybody's had access. watching it, wow. but it was beautiful because you know you tick, 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 and then yeah. the next thing you know, it we, got totally addictive. We had, like, we um, had uh, watching that thing. You just sit there going, "Holy smokes! I can't believe all these people are buying our product." Yeah, yeah. we had twenty thousand people sign up in that first month, wow. and for a company, again, I mean, we were a small company at the time. These are twenty. That twenty thousand people paying ten dollars a month for the product. We didn't. Mm -hmm. We I forgot what we kept five or seven or something like yeah. that. And we had twenty thousand next month. And it literally, it suddenly changed everything that we were doing because yeah. before we were just a small company just trying to get by and get our product. And now suddenly, like the rocket motors had been lit. Yeah. And our biggest issue for probably the next three years was how quickly can we scale? How can like we how, how how can we bring people in to cover the new phones? The right how can we sign new have. deals? Yes, <laughs> it's still a huge problem. And yeah. having gone through yeah. that and looking at it from the other side, I can see, and you'll appreciate this as an yeah. HR person, yeah. you know, how challenging that problem is and how maintaining the company culture is so difficult oh, during that time. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, this was one of the things that I think, and a lot of it has to do with chemistry as an HR person, you will mm -hmm. appreciate this, that like, if you have the right chemistry, it doesn't really matter how many people you have. If you have the yeah. right people and they're working yeah. well together. You can, I mean, at that time, we had like less than 20 people. At yeah, the I think we had like 15. Maybe. I mean, it was unbelievable. No one knew that. Yeah. People thought we were much bigger than we were. Right. But we were like 20 people. And that's what we accomplished was incredible. And I feel that a lot of the same chemistry and energy right now with Legion yeah. M, it's all about getting getting that energy and getting people together and working well together and right. not against each other. You know, and, and if you're all lifting at the same time, you'd be surprised what you can how do. much 20 people can lift. A lot yeah. more than 100 people right. that aren't working yes. together. Yeah, True. It's incredible. So now we take the fast forward. Mm -hmm. So you had the Moby TV. You know, you obviously proved a lot of people wrong yep. with the model and that it works. And now it's just a normal part of life. And again, a lot of people who are listening will go like, I can't ever imagine a world where I didn't have this on. Yeah, it's like know, an ATM. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what? We didn't. Or can you that? imagine a world where somebody tells you nobody's ever going to watch television on? Right. Like, exactly. That's the no stupidest one. thing yes. I've right. heard. So you had a lightning moment, mm -hmm. literally. Caught from lightning OBTA. in a bottle. Yep. So what was the lightning moment that sparked Legion? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's I, a great question. I would say it's probably the Jobs Act. Although in this case, I think it was really the a culmination of. Of Moby TV, the New York Rock Exchange, yeah. the Jobs Act, you know, and and kind of meeting up with. I with think if you had to look team. at the lightning moment, I think you'd have to say it's when we came up with the idea for the New York Rock Exchange. Yeah. When, you know, and we watching American Idol. This was literally watching American Idol. I forgot what season it was, but a bunch of us got into it. We had a pool going where each of us could, and we weren't betting real money, but it was just for fun and for honor. But one of us, and I don't even remember if it was Paul or I, or, or but he said, wouldn't it be cool if you could buy stock in one of these artists? Hmm. And that, you know, again, this was like six years ago, probably, you yeah, know, that this idea came up, right? We ended up spinning off, you know, Underground Labs, the New York Rock Exchange. And, and we but, spun that out of Moby TV. Yeah. Sorry. Spinning that out of Moby TV. That was six or seven years ago. And, you know, looked at how we could make that happen. And the second part of it. So that was kind of the lightning moment, the inspiration that started yeah. us on this path. And we've done all the studying and we've, you know, 
monitoring this. And the the really the enabler though was the Jobs Act because when yeah. that went through suddenly. All the stuff that we had thought about so deeply and tried to figure out ways to get around securities laws to enable it suddenly could be done. And yeah. that's, you know, that's right. what versus, we're this versus one. trying to do another Moby TV type business in the traditional model, in the traditional way. Yes. You wanted to elevate this uh, concept that you've proven with yes. content delivery, access to a lot of people, yeah. the, the, the multiple collaboration things into you know, entertainment. So, well, we were looking at, you know, how the jobs act is going to affect crowdfunding. Right. And, you know, we think of, you know, it's being called now equity crowdfunding, right. Which makes it sound really similar to crowdfunding, but in our case, I mean, we feel like it's vastly different. It's yeah. a real, I mean, it's next level in a big and important way. We love crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has been amazing. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all these platforms have been phenomenal for entrepreneurs and for, and for people to get involved and to be supportive of these things. And we really feel like, you know, if you, if you take that and put that into a securities marketplace, that's really powerful. And, and, you know, this is very new and we don't think, the world has even a clue how big it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the way we thought of the TV on your phone. Like for us, it was so crystal clear that no, trust us. And we would tell people, trust us five years from now, everybody's going to be watching video on the phone. And people would look at us and go, no, <laughs> they won't. And we're like, no, seriously, they will trust us. Let's have this conversation in five years. And, I feel like the same conversation could be had right now, which is funding startups, not like Kickstarter startups where you're donating to a startup and helping them out or buying a t-shirt or a coffee mug, but actually actively investing in and choosing and helping those startups be successful. That's going to be very commonplace. And it'll be a big part of how we long-term manage our portfolio of investments. Mm -hmm. And it's a fun and interesting place to invest, but it's also where there's potential growth, massive growth, right? If you look at the, I mean, most people aren't that satisfied with the returns they're getting in the stock market. Now, to be clear, this is super risky, right? So you can't just put all your money into one startup, but investing in, you know, a variety of startups. And if you're smart and you invest in the right ones, I mean, it can, these these types of returns are massive. They don't even compare to what you what you see in the traditional market. Right. Yeah. But but one thing I'm interested in is so talking about risk. Yeah. So how do you as entrepreneurs assess the kind of risk that went into the Moby TV versus the kind of risk in this venture? For the investor or for us as the entrepreneurs? Well, for both, but right. mainly for you guys. Like you know, in terms of saying, hey, is this a good venture to go down? Well, it's it, being it's, so new, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I think it's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, for me, I've really come to understand the relationship between risk and reward. There was a really seminal moment for me at Moby TV where I was sitting in a room with a bunch of peers. This was way into the process, right? And we're sitting around the table and I'm like, wow, I mean, there's a lot of really smart people in this room. Like, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I, mean, I think you probably can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right now, maybe. <laughs> you are the technical guy. Yeah. But but not only that, like these, there's a bunch of really talented, hardworking people. Like, I'm not even the hardest working person in this room, right? But my potential upside from Moby TV was orders and orders and orders of magnitude greater than anybody else that was in the room at that time. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that separated us, right, was the fact that I was there at the beginning. Like, I was willing to risk, right? I took no salary and deferred salary and, you know, put my career on the line. And because of that, even though I wasn't the smartest person in the company or even the hardest working person in the company, I had so much more to gain. And so it really is about risk and reward. And so for me, you know, for me personally, I can say I feel like I've got probably more to lose now. With Legion M, like I'm risking more, right? Because back when we started Moby TV, I didn't have a reputation. I didn't have a, yeah. you know, my career wasn't as far along. My family wasn't as, you know, big and all that sort of stuff. And so I think that 
like I'm risking way more. But I also, you know, I think when you look at that risk reward trade off, there's two things that that occur to me. One is the size of the reward. And I think that the opportunity with Legion M, I think is, I mean, Moby TV was a huge opportunity and we we nailed most of it, you know. Mm I think Legion M is bigger. I think Legion M could simply be massive. I think there's yeah. one thing. I think the second thing is, is that, you know, nine out of 10 startups fail, right? I mean, a huge majority of startups fail. But if you narrow it down to startups with a team that's experienced, you know, and, you know, in an area like, like you can winnow it down. And I think it's actually far less risky than a lot of people think that it is. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, that's how I kind of net it out. And so, you know, I'm kind of risk blind. <laughs> well, I would say I definitely don't think of Jeff and I and the projects that we get in as like a one in 10 probability. You know, I don't count on them 100% like to be successful, but we are entrepreneurs and we like the risk. It's what motivates us. It's what causes us to work, you know, all through the night and and to do something in, impactful. I would say with Moby TV, one of the things that, that we did, and I think we're doing the same thing here is, you know, it wasn't like we bet, you know, a hundred million dollars before we knew if it was a good idea. Or yeah. Not. Mm-hmm. So we were pretty scrappy. We were careful. We were practical in how we were going to ramp things up. And I think we're doing the same thing with Legion M, which is, you know, we put the idea out there. It didn't cost us millions of dollars to put the idea. Out, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we put the idea out there. We spent a little bit of money. We went to Silicon Valley comic con and we saw the response. You guys were there. It, Blew right. us away. That so we knew. Okay, this is you know pe- we're on to something. You know, it's not just because we have a lot of ideas. You know, and they're not always good. So you know, it, it's it's reassuring to get that kind of response, and it's also encouraged us to bet more and yeah. to to, but, yeah. to but, go but, larger. But sort of rationalizing that bet, right? So it's something new. The Jobs mm-hmm. Act created an opportunity. Yes. <clears throat> You're going up against a very old school, traditional mm-hmm. distribution, how movies are made, everything else. You're basically challenging that. And you're choosing, it seems mostly, you didn't go with art house film choices. <laughs> you're going, you, know, you went to Comic-Con to yes. launch. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit in terms of, you talk. there's the risk with that. Well, when you, we put, it, go when you put it that way, I actually... There, I, I, I want to add something to my answer because when you put it that way, I would say in a lot of ways, Moby TV was a way bigger risk mm. because we didn't have any sort of, we didn't have the level of positive encouragement that we're getting now. I mean, the one oh, yeah. thing that Jeff and I, we, we both acknowledge is that in the first couple of months of a startup or the first six months of working on a startup, in all of our career, we've never seen this level of traction yeah. and momentum. Mm. So early. So, so early. all the other ones took much longer, like especially Moby TV. You know, we, we founded Moby TV in 1999. It wasn't until 2003, I think, that we actually launched mm-hmm. the Moby TV product. Yeah. And that was four years of hard slogging through the dot com burst, uh, and, yeah. which really has, you know, when Paul talks about running things lean and scrappy, like that's one of the great entrepreneurial lessons that I think that we've had. And we had it ground into us because we spent four years, we never had more than probably two months worth of run rate in the bank. Yeah. You know, we would literally we were fighting for our life. <laughs> we, we, we all were working on, you know, partial salaries because, you know, we were in the startup mode. We couldn't yeah. afford full salaries. We would literally every, lunch, we would go into the conference room with a bag of bread and a <laughs> jar of peanut butter and jelly. I'm not kidding you. Seriously. And everybody I mean, in the company, from YouTube. the CEO, oh, you know, to Paul. Early I mean, YouTube. The, yeah, and we would make ourselves peanut butter jelly sandwiches. And that was our, our lunches, you know, as, yeah. a, as a team. And so, but but it really, to me, the essence of entrepreneuring, <laughs> I don't think that's a word, but yeah. you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Donator. Is figuring, <laughs> figuring out how you can get to your next 
proof point, your next milestone, milestone, whilst expending the least amount of resources as possible. And I think that if you look at like so many startup companies, they go out there, they get a bunch of money and they're like, oh, we need all these departments. You know, we need fancy office space. We need to throw a party that say that we arrived. And an experienced entrepreneur, it's like, forget all that. We need to hit this milestone, you know, to show that this is a viable business. And then from there, we're going to double down and get to the next milestone. Well, and the other thing to take into consideration is that, you know, in this case, especially, um, you know, with Moby TV, we have raised venture capital and, you know, venture capital is, is different because you're in, you know, you're investing the, typically the VC is encouraging you to spend the money. They actually want you to spend it. They want you to grow. They want you to scale. They want you to do all those things. And, you know, you're kind of balancing that with your practical approach and wanting to, you know, have a long runway and all these things. But I think in this case, because we're starting from day one with, you know, the angel money has come from our friends and family and the funding is coming from our fans or from the fans. Right. So we really care about every dollar we spend. You know, this is. This is yeah. someone's hard earned money. Yeah. It's not coming from some huge pool of, you know, venture capital money. This is something that, you know, and, and we like, I think it's motivating for us. It's also scary, you yeah. know, because so many of our friends and our family and other well, people. Or, I'm sorry. To no, it's right. But I was just going to say, even in the Legion, you know, our private Facebook group, right? Like we're, we're interacting with these people and a lot of them are like, they just put in a hundred bucks, you know, we get people saying, like, I don't have a hundred bucks, you know, how can I, you know? And so like knowing that people are putting that money and they're putting their faith in us and it's on us, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like we gotta make it, it work. In, in, in a way it's way scarier than dealing with venture capitalists. Yeah. Right. Cause venture capitalists, I mean, shoot, you know, if you lose their money like that, they play they that game play for a living. One in 10. Yeah. Exactly. So they actually, if you don't, if you flame out they're you know, they're okay. They'll yeah. invest in your There's next another one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so um, so coalescing this now, right? And, and obviously we'll, you know, pe- encourage people to go check out Legion M and, you know, understand the prospectus, what you're trying to do. But in your words, what do you want Legion M really ultimately at the end to do in terms of, you know, disrupting the current state of things? It's a good question. I mean, if, if I think maybe we should both answer, but like my perspective is I, I look at legendary. Right. And Thomas told him what he's done with Legendary. I mean, he was an outsider, got into Hollywood for the right reasons, wanted to do things for the fans and do the right things. And also, you know, to make um, to build value. He did that with Wall Street money and he's been incredibly successful. I mean, it, you know, it's amazing what he's done in a short period of time. And uh, I think he's added value to the industry and improved on things and pushed the boundaries on stuff. We want to have a similar impact and we want to be as big, if not bigger. I mean, our, our, when we put it simply, if you say, look, 10 years from now, the next legendary is owned by the fans. We think that company is not worth what legendary is worth. It's worth five X what legendary is worth right now. And five to 10 X, because I think being owned by the fans gives you a massive differentiator. Mm -hmm. You know, legendary is owned by a fan and now a Chinese billionaire, (laughs) right? And it happens to be a, you know, a smart relationship. I applaud that actually. I think it's smart what he's done, but we could be a company like that, that's owned by the fans. Mm -hmm. And that, that is hard to compete with. Right. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And for me, you know, for me personally, this is the funnest job that I could imagine, right? Because really, like, our goal is to make cool shit happen right. and, and share it, like, with everybody. Like, the fact that everybody can be involved with this just takes everything that we're doing and it, and it magnifies it by a factor of 10. Yeah. And so I think that really, at the end of the day, I mean, that's... That's what I want to do. I want to, you know, put a dent in the universe and have some fun, really. Well, that's and yeah. So I, I, I would agree. I mean, if you if you put it in non-commercial terms, I want to. I think we can be the most influential company on the planet, entertainment company, 
you know, and to do to really have an impact on the industry to create new franchises and not be stuck retreading, you know, existing franchises and to get behind, you know, un, unproven but talented creators and, and to put them into, you know, uh, the mainstream. And, you know, I think we can have a, a positive influence on an industry that we love and support. So we're not critical of Hollywood, but there's room for improvement. You right. know, I mean, there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Like people ask us sometimes, like, are we disruptive? You know? And I think that, yeah, I mean, we're disruptive in the way that every evolutionary company, like, you know, we're doing something dramatically different. Right. But we're not immediately like displacing anybody. Right. You know, it's like, we're working with the studios. We're working with creators. Right. We're, we feel like we're creating opportunity, you know, for, up and coming talent. We feel like we're creating opportunity for fans to get involved with it, but it's not like directly at the expense of somebody else. Right. You know what I mean? It's not like we've come in and like we're doing battle with, with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Like, and so far, to be honest, everybody that we've talked to in Hollywood, like we haven't had a meeting that's ended with somebody being gruff and saying, Oh no, I'm going to take you guys down. Right. Yeah. It's like, cause it's, no, it's always been, it's been <laughs> that. That's where I would say the risk is lower than Moby TV because that Moby TV was more contentious, especially in the early days. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally people being like, no, you're not going to do this. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> but in our case, I think it's different because it's like people at first, you know, either totally get it and are immediately on board or they're skeptical or misunderstanding or just not getting it. But literally by the end of the meeting, you know, 99% of the time. I mean, I don't, yeah. like Jeff said, I don't think we've had anyone, no one's left not feeling good about it. And people usually come completely around. I mean, a lot of our, we've had a lot of press interviews that start off like, yeah, tell me about this. Okay, you know, skeptical, whatever, you know, and trying to like poke holes in it or whatever. And then literally that person becomes an investor. Wow. <laughs> you know, and we hear from them later, by the way, you totally convinced me. Yeah. I, I like I'm on board now. I was skeptical. And now I'm not only did I write a positive article about you, but I invested. Right. And, uh, and on that note, before we you know, close with my final question, yep. you were quoted by, I think it was the Sprint contact that you had back in Moby TV. They said they gave us a solution that was easy to use. And they're guys that are easy to work with. <laughs> and I think that that is so critical for, you know, the story that you guys have been together. You've been through the lean startup period. Mm -hmm. You've been through hard times. You created this, you know, one disruptive model. Now you're moving to another disruptive model. And I think that that relationship is so key in what you're trying to do. Yeah. You know, and, and so, and, and I say for myself and having, you know, knowing you guys and being so, you know, warm and willing to talk about your journey, you know, it's really great. So let me end you with this question then. Okay. If you could share a drink with anybody, who would it be and why? And you can each answer separately. Living or living or dead? Well, ideally living, but it could be whatever. <laughs> yeah. It ideally could be whatever you want. Living. Okay. okay, I'll answer because I already know. So if we go with the living dead or maybe could be thought out, I would go with Walt Disney. I'm a huge Walt Disney fan. He was such an amazing innovator, you know, and if you don't know the story of Walt Disney, I really encourage you to go check it. Cause I mean, going back to Snow White, you know, to his use of audio animatronics, to his use of television as a new medium, like a true, true innovator. And if we had to go with someone who is confirmed living today, <laughs> I would go with Elon Musk because I see him as, as a, a, a current uh, iteration of that sort of, that sort of visionary, the sort of person who can sit back and say, you know, there's no reason why we can't go to Mars. You know what I mean? Like it's a problem, but th these are the pieces and, you know, someone that can just lift up the world and move it and set it back down in the direction that they want. I think mm -hmm. Paul, um, I would agree on the Elon Musk. I would have a drink with him, but that he wouldn't be my first choice. My first choice, and it's someone that I've that I've met with, and we were fortunate enough to meet with them. But I would I would have a drink with them again is Guillermo del Toro. Mm -hmm. You know, just because for what we're doing, I think he he embodies a lot of kind of what we. I mean, he was 
you know, discovered and, and then has gone on to achieve greatness in, um, in the entertainment space. And he's also just, you know, he's, he's someone that, uh, we have a lot of respect for. And, uh, I think he'd be a fun guy to have a mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, Paul, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing a spirit of conversation with me. And thank one you. final toast yep. to Legion you. M. Cheers. And All the right. success and that the comes. Of conversation. Thank you Cheers. for your investment. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For show notes and to get more insights from entrepreneurs and spirit lovers alike, please visit spiritedconversation.biz.